This is Dr. Stiff. He's our foot and ankle specialist. Am I on? There we go. And there we go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Stith. I'm one of the orthopedic foot and ankle surgeons with OCR. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, Liz Frank injuries in the midfoot. And more importantly, when I'm done, you guys get to go to lunch. So we're going to power on through this. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so a little history. Liz Frank injuries um, were named after a uh, French surgeon, Jacques Lix Franck. I uh, was a Napoleon, uh, uh, surgeon in Napoleon Bonaparte's army who described a midfoot amputation, uh, disarticulation amputation uh, at the tarsal metatarsal joints, um, which was commonly seen in cavalry riders who would fall off of their horses, get their foot caught in the stirrup, and have a plantar flexion twisting injury that would dislocate the midfoot. A little bit about the anatomy. Uh, the Lisfranc ligament itself connects the base of the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform. The second metatarsal base acts as the keystone in the transverse arch of the foot, which is critical for maintaining foot alignment and arch alignment uh, and preventing collapse. The ligament itself has three main components, the dorsal, the interosseous, and the plantar aspect of the ligaments, with the interosseous being the strongest. Uh, the overall incidence for low-energy Lisfranc injuries is unknown. A lot of times, uh, this injury is simply uh, written off as a sprain by patients. They don't come in to get seen, or it's a very subtle injury that gets missed. Uh, a couple of separate studies, one looking at uh, collegiate football players, found about a 4% annual incidence for Lisfranc injuries. Another separate study uh, from a single university institution looking at all of their athletes um, showed about a 12% incidence in all foot injuries that required treatment. The mechanism of injury, the high energy in mechanisms are typically motor vehicle collisions, falls from a height. Those are uh, usually a direct dorsiflexion force on the foot causing the dislocation. The low energy ones, though, are a little bit different. The direct low energy mechanisms, uh, when you see in sports, things like uh, football players stepping on another football player's arch or the top of the foot causing a direct crush injury. Um, a, a lot of sports where there's cutting and pivoting, twisting type activities. Uh, when a patient has a plantar flexed and planted foot and they pivot away from it, that can overpower the ligaments in the midfoot and lead to a tear. The indirect mechanisms, patients uh, that aren't participating specifically in sports a lot of times will come in saying they've stepped into a hole and fallen forward, they've tripped going down the stairs and caught their foot, um, and then falling onto a plantar flex foot or someone falling onto a foot that's been plantar flexed, uh, which is common in a football tackle injury. Um, diagnosis, so when any of these kind of mechanisms comes in to see you guys in the office, this is, this is the type of uh, mechanism where you want to start having a high suspicion for this type of injury. Uh, when you see them in the office, their pain can be pretty variable. They can come in walking on it and maybe only have pain when they're trying to do running, jumping, cutting, or pivoting type activities, all the way up to the more unstable injuries where they're unable to bear any weight secondary to the pain. When you examine them in the office, a um, couple of things that'll stand out, an ecchymosis sign, which is plantar bruising in the arch of the foot, is generally pathognomonic for a midfoot sprain injury or damage in the midfoot. Um, they'll be tender directly over usually the first and second tarsal metatarsal joints. Uh, if you try and stress them with either a midfoot abduction or a dorsiflexion stress test, it'll elicit pain. And sometimes in the more unstable injuries, you can actually feel the shift in the joints. Um, also, for uh, the, maybe the in patients that come walking in, if you try to have them do a single leg rise or a hop test, they won't be able to do that. Uh, radiographic imaging uh, is the first step after the examination. Uh, biggest thing about imaging on x-rays is you want to get a weight-bearing x-ray. And the reason behind this is that it provides a dynamic exam that can put pressure on the Lisfranc interval and show disruption in that space that you won't see necessarily on a non-weight-bearing x-ray. When you look, the findings that you're looking for, a flex sign uh, is a small avulsion fracture off of the base of the second metatarsal, which the arrow points to here. Um, loss of the normal parallel alignment between the medial border of the second metatarsal with the medial cuneiform, and then gapping between the uh, first and second metatarsal bases or the in, uh, middle and um, medial cuneiforms. 
Uh, any gapping, usually over about two to three millimeters, is considered abnormal. Uh, you do want to get a weight-bearing x-ray on the contralateral side, though, um, in order to have a normal side to base off of, because uh, some people have just a slightly wider interval, and that's normal. Uh, and then on the lateral x-ray, any loss of the sagittal malalignment where the, um, the dorsal metatarsal creates a step off that you see here, that's indicative of instability. Advanced imaging, MRIs are indicated in cases where if a patient's unable to, because of their pain, they're not able to bear full weight to get a weight-bearing x-ray, or they've failed reasonable conservative management, they're still suspicious they have pain in the region, um, that'd be a reason to get an MRI. In those cases, the MRI is going to usually identify tearing within the ligament, either within a portion, usually the dorsal, or within the central interosseous and plantar ligaments, or a complete tear. You'll also see bony edema within the second metatarsal base, medial cuneiform. Um, CT scan um, can be beneficial, particularly in patients that can't have an MRI, people with pacemakers, etc. Um, and these ones, they can be beneficial because they, if, especially if you have access to a weight-bearing CT scanner, those can also be a dynamic, X or a dynamic exam similar to a weight-bearing x-ray. And they can also show non-displaced um, non fractures or the flex, uh, flex fractures of the second metatarsal base. Management of the lis frank injuries. When, so when can a lis frank injury be treated non-operatively? The basic... Um, Frail elderly patients, low demand patients, patients that are typically non-ambulatory, many times these can really truly be treated non-operatively. Um, patients that are slightly more active than that though, if they demonstrate tearing on an MRI where you see it there, but their dynamic exam, a weight-bearing CT scan or a weight-bearing x-ray does not demonstrate any instability, these are the patients that are reasonable to treat non-operatively. In that situation, the protocol is generally a four to six week period of non-weight bearing, either in a uh, cast or a removable cast boot. Uh, at that point, you follow up with repeat weight bearing x-rays, progress to weight bearing in a protective boot or a walking boot, or a walking cast. You usually want to get repeat x-rays every two to week, three weeks during this time to make sure that the, the area stays stable. At the end of another four to six weeks, um, if they're doing well, their pain is progressively improving, you can transfer them to a regular shoe with a graphite insole. And just to keep in mind, it can take sometimes four to six months for these injuries to really start to stabilize and allow them to start getting back to a lot of their regular activities and participating in sports. Surgical management, basically any time that there is evidence of instability, shift on the x-ray, a fracture, those are indications where you need to refer on to a um, uh, surgeon for surgical management and fixation to restore the normal anatomy and stabilize the midfoot. There are multiple different ways to go about treating this. A few examples you can see up here. Um, most of these are dictated by the uh, fracture pattern or in, uh, pattern of instability and then also surgeon preference. Um, if you happen to see a purely ligamentous injury, more than about two millimeters of gapping, even without a fracture, that still is a reason to refer on, and that's something that should still be treated surgically. The long-term complications generally come from unrecognized injuries um, or delayed presentation beyond four to six months out, and usually what these go on to develop are post-traumatic arthritic changes, collapse of the midfoot, where um, really the only salvage option at that point is to fuse the midfoot in order to restore the normal anatomy again. Um, obviously leading to lower likelihood of patients continuing on with competitive sports. That's really about it. This one was a short and sweet to let you guys get to lunch. Uh, is there any questions? No? Excellent. <laughs>